Hi, this is Barry, and welcome to Simplicity Zen. If you're enjoying these podcasts, please consider liking and subscribing on YouTube, or you can sign up for updates on SimplicityZen.com. Today, my guest is Soto Zen priest, Kyosho Valerie Beer. Kyosho has practiced Zen Buddhism since 1991. Incidentally, it's the year I started, too. Mm. Uh, she was ordained as a Zen priest in 2005 and received Dharma transmission in 2013 from her teacher, Edward Brown. She lived at Green Gulch Farm from 2003 to 2012, at which time she moved to San Francisco Zen Center, City Center. After serving as San Francisco Zen Center corporate secretary, she was a city center Eno, otherwise known as the head of the med- meditation hall, is now supporting the Branchy Stream sagas as a visiting teacher. Branchy Streams being affiliated Zen centers with San Francisco Zen Center in the Suzuki Roshi lineage. She's also a sta- an established teacher of sewing the Buddha's robe. Thank you so much for being here today with us, Valerie. I'm delighted to be here, Barry. Nice to see you. Did I get the basic information correct? You did. Thank you. I'm curious, what is um, what is the um, uh, the corporate secretary do? I've never heard of that position. Uh, it takes minutes at board meetings, basically. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's very much an administrative. It, that was an administrative function. So uh, uh-huh. the idea is that you alternate between administrative and temple jobs. Mm-hmm. And so I was the secretary, then I was the Eno. Cool. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you want to dive in, could you tell us a little bit about where you grew up and what kind of your family circumstances were like and so forth? Uh, I grew up in Southern California in Long mm-hmm. Beach. And okay. I was the only child of my parents, both of whom were teachers. Mm -hmm. They raised me, I think the best way to say it is with the belief that I would find my own way, which has been really helpful, but also a challenge, right? Because sometimes when you're finding your own way, you fall off a cliff, right? (laughs) Right. (laughs) Stumbling along uh, in the dark. So uh, I lived in Long Beach uh, through high school, and then I, I wanted to experience the other coast. So I went to college at George Washington University in Mm -hmm. Washington, DC, where I met my husband. Uh, He's no longer my husband, but uh, met him there. He was in ROTC. So we spent four years uh, stationed in Germany. Mm -hmm. So as you might imagine, right now I am uh, keeping an eye on what's happening in Ukraine uh, Mm -hmm. because that is pretty close. relatively speaking. And uh, I actually was in in Kiev for a week uh, one time when I worked at Apple. So um, this is kind of near and dear to my heart. So I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, uh, I may wisdom prevail, what can yes. I say? Um, so this is kind of coming home uh, to me. <laughs> uh, so I I, uh, we moved back to Southern California after our stint in Germany, and uh, I have a, a master's degree and a doctorate from Southern Cal and uh, USC, and went to work my first high tech, tech job at Xerox Corporation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then a bunch of us decamped from Xerox to Apple, uh, which mm-hmm. is when I moved to the Bay Area. Mm-hmm. And that move was, was good for my career and not good for some other aspects of my life. Uh, my marriage did not survive the move, uh, unfortunately. And uh, I turned out to be in those early years, not a very good parent uh, to my daughter because I was very consumed with my career uh, and now a single parent uh, and very stressed out as you might imagine. Mm -hmm. So my dad had gone on a retreat um, and I was talking with him one time and uh, he said, I asked him where he had went and he said, well, it's a place I think you might like. It's Green Gulch Farm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And basically that conversation changed my life uh, because I was looking for a quiet place to spend the weekends. Uh, My ex-husband had our daughter on the weekends, so I, she wasn't with me. And I remember the first time that I went to Green Gulch and I turned down the driveway and I felt like I was coming home. You just felt right. I just felt right. Mm-hmm. I did. So, uh, so I kept going. So many weekends uh, I would go. This was in 1992. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And in 2002, my daughter graduated from high school and went to college. And on the way uh, home from taking her to college, I mailed my application to uh, Green Gulch mm -hmm. and moved in uh, and moved out 13 years later. So, you, so I stayed. Yeah. As a kid, were you raised with any sort of religious context? Were your parents? Uh, nominally Christian. Uh, mm -hmm. We attended a congregational church when I was very little and then a, a new Methodist church that had, had been built. My parents were not particularly uh, religious. Uh, they weren't opposed to it. Uh, I think it didn't speak to their heart. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, for many reasons that I won't go into, Christianity was not uh, although I could go into them, Christianity was not the, the spiritual path that I chose, uh, mm -hmm. but Buddhism, I chose Buddhism because that turned down the driveway and then what I found there spoke to my heart. Mm -hmm. um, as a kid and a teenager, would you, did you think about religious matters or spiritual matters? Did, was it part of your consciousness at all? Uh, I had some friends who were very much into Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, you know, I, they didn't pressure uh, around uh, religion. And I don't think it was particularly up for me uh, as a topic. Uh, I did pick up um, uh, D.T. Suzuki's book when I was in college, uh, mm -hmm. the name of which is escaping me at the moment, but Introduction, Introduction to Zen Buddhism or something, you know, like yeah. that. Um, so, and, and I remember that, uh, that it sounded very interesting, um, mm -hmm. but I didn't really formally pick up Buddhism or any other spiritual practice until I turned down that driveway. Um, so there was that book and then there, there was the driveway and not much in between. And not much in between, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. in between. I'm, yeah, I'm curious, when you went to, uh, from Xerox to Apple, was that right around the time that Apple took the user interface from Xerox Spark and kind of- invented It was the indeed, or? yes. Yeah. <laughs> so- Were you involved the, um, that at all? Yeah, so I, my last year at Xerox, um, I spent mostly at Xerox Park, uh, the Palo Alto Research Center uh, here in Palo Alto, which is where I live now. I, and so there were a bunch of us that saw that uh, Xerox's invention of the PC was actually gonna go nowhere. Uh, mm -hmm. And even though I wasn't involved in the invention of that, I was on the uh, education and human resources side, it seemed that uh, the place to be was Apple and it was indeed. Uh, did you get to interact with Steve Jobs at all? I did, <laughs> I did. And, and all I will say about that is the book about him is accurate, the movie not so much. Okay. <laughs> you know, he was um, a supporter of Chelsea's Zen Center and interested yes, he was. in Soto Zoom. I think he vi visited AAG towards the end of his life. If yes, I think mistaken. he did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And, you know, and I think clearly, you know, the, the minimalist kind of, uh, simp uh, I don't know if simple is the right word, but the minimalist and elegant, you know, kind of um, design ethos of Apple clearly, I think, comes from Jobs' love of Zen and Japanese aesthetics and so forth. Yes, I think it does. I think also the the idea is so interesting, isn't it, Barry, that the idea of Apple was, you know, personal computing for everybody, right? Changing the world one person at a time. And that's kind of Buddhism's idea too, is mm -hmm. that, you know, just take this up and figure this out for yourself and then figure out how to stop suffering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I, I think also, you know, in his early years, he took acid and went to India and, mm -hmm. You know, and you know, and I mean, so definitely, it's, it's really interesting how there's kind of some churning there. You know, uh -huh. multiple karmic vectors. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so, did you? Um, and you don't have to talk about this, or you could just say I don't want to talk about it if you want. But did did you have any experience with psychedelics during that no, era? No, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't. Uh -huh. Yeah, it it sort of wasn't. Um, it wasn't part of the crowd that I ran with uh, mm -hmm. at school. Um, and I did, I will tell you about this. I did have one very bad experience uh, with a narcotic. Uh, I was given codeine for uh, the pain of an infection that I was having when I was in college. Mm -hmm. And it felt so good. And it scared me. 
-hmm. because I never wanted to feel that good due to a substance again. Yeah, and I can so, Yeah. Yeah, I, um, one time I had a cough, a uh, sore throat that just would not go away. And, you know, it, just, it felt like, like I felt like it was bleeding, like it hurts so bad, you know, and, mm -hmm, and they gave me mm -hmm. a codeine cough syrup. And I remember thinking like, oh, like, I see, I get it. Yeah. And codeine in this grand scheme of things, I think is pretty, like, it's the only opiate I've ever tried, but yeah, my understanding that's pretty mild in the scope of opiates. Yeah, too. and that was, you know, that was bad enough for me. So, so this was pretty early in my college career and I was aware that people around me were doing, you know, other drugs, but it was really interesting because of that. I think because of that experience with codeine, it was, you know, I, it felt way too good. Mm -hmm. And I never wanted to be dependent on a substance to feel mm -hmm. that good. It scared me. It really did. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a lot of wisdom for a, a college kid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people, you, you know, I've, I've done about 27 of these interviews or so forth. Mm -hmm. and, and it's really interesting hearing people's kind of motivation for getting into practice some people it's almost they just want an adventure you know mm -hmm. some people just want to know the truth you're know, like why am i here you know what you know what is this you know, why do i have consciousness like what is what's the truth you know and some people you know just like i'm hurting and i don't want to hurt mm -hmm. would you say do, do would any of those relate to your path at all or some combination or none of them or uh it does the the one you know that i'm hurt and i don't want to hurt anymore yes i'll get to that in a minute okay so remind me if i forget to go there okay. but the real appeal of that turn down the driveway and my first experience of green gulch was that i i am way off the scale on the introvert end of things and my my definition of heaven is warm dark and quiet mm -hmm. And that's maybe not so much the warm, especially at Tassajara in the wintertime, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but the dark and quiet, I need that uh, as an introvert. That's how I get recharged, um, you know, that. So getting to spend hours a day in mm -hmm. dark and quiet, if not necessarily warm, although I did learn to bundle up under my robes, uh, that, was amazingly appealing to me because as you might imagine my job was crazy you know <laughs> you know if you're in high tech mm -hmm. um so um uh, and uh because of um uh some personal things that were going on that this is the part i guess where i say that i don't want to go too deeply into this part but let's just say yeah. that there were some things going on in my life where i didn't feel safe mm -hmm. and i needed a refuge and I especially needed to be in a place where a particular person couldn't find me because I didn't feel safe that mm -hmm. at least before the internet, so we're talking before the internet here, this was early nineties, mm -hmm. um, you couldn't find Green Gulch and Tassajara literally by the road unless you had a good reason for- They didn't have that sign there. Yeah, it was, it was you know, and of course Tassajara is 14 miles down a dirt road, right? Yeah. So, so this was, I wouldn't say that this was even half the reason, but maybe this was 25% of the reason. The other reason, the other 75% was the warm, dark and quiet recharge for the extreme introvert. Yeah. Um, is, is it really only 14 miles? Because that feels like 60. Yeah, it does. I, mean, I guess you're going so slow and you yeah. Know. Yeah, it's yeah. it's 14 miles from the dirt road starts at Jamesburg. So huh. Jamesburg to the to the gate at Tassajara is 14 miles. Yeah. yeah. And you're yeah, right. I'm, it I'm, feels like forever. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm afraid of heights. I, I I hate that road, you know. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm not afraid of heights and I hate that road. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh you know, it's funny when when I, the first time I went to Green Gulch, and I'd already practiced a little bit. I, I felt disoriented, like mm -hmm. I was losing myself in a way. Like I did, like I felt like, like, it, it, not in an unpleasant way, but I felt like unsettled and like, mm -hmm. like I was just being there. Phys the physical sensation of being there, it was, it was very powerful for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it was intriguing to me. Like, I, it wasn't necessarily negative, but it was, it, it wasn't like a peaceful, like, ah, oh, you know, mm -hmm. it was like, mm -hmm. whoa, something. Mm -hmm. There's some experiment going on here that you know yeah um so when you went to green gulch um 
Were you there when the Zenda was being worked on, and so they had to do a session at um, City Center? I, so I was there when the when the Zendo was being worked on. Uh, this was this was before I moved in. So okay. the Zendo uh, for the the early part of the time that I went there, the Zendo was a white oh. uh, tent out oh. uh, on the office lawn. What, what, what was the office lawn? <laughs> yeah, because the reason I ask is my first Zen experience. Well, my second Zen experience was a seven day session with the green goat folks and, you know, Reb Anderson and everyone, mm -hmm. but it was at city center because the, mm. the and, I, and I could never remember if that was 91 or 92. So, I, mm -hmm. so that's why I was going to ask you. Yeah. It was probably 92, I would guess. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was, um, so when you, so you, so did you visit for the Sunday program? Is that. Uh, I would go for the weekends often and sometimes stay in the guest house uh, or stay in uh, student housing so that I could have the whole weekend. And sometimes so your I first visit was you got a room and stayed there. I got a room and stayed there uh -huh. for Saturday Was the Wheelwright night. Center existing built at that point? The Wheelwright Center was there. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. That, and I'm calling it right now, the kind of the hand-built octagonal type guest house type the guest house yeah the yeah. guest house was there mm -hmm. yeah is that yeah. the wheelwright or am i getting messed up with my name uh, there's there's two the wheelwright is the one next to the dining room and oh, the okay. guest house is out by by the yurt okay i was messing up yeah. the name sorry mm -hmm. um so did you um who do you remember who gave the dharma talk like who kind of the first teacher you encountered was there uh, the first teacher, well, it, it's interesting. Uh, the first teacher I encountered there was on a one day sitting that I went to uh, with Ed Brown. Oh. And he said uh, two things that kind of rocked my world. Uh, he said, uh, feel what you're feeling. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, <laughs> no, I don't want to feel what I'm feeling. I know what's down there. I, uh, uh, uh. I have a job where I spend it in my head and uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, let your experience come home to your heart. Mm -hmm. And I sat there on the ton. I remember as I was on the back ton. So the one the, that's right there when you come, when you enter the Zendo from Cloud yeah, Hall down the stairs. and go yeah. down the stairs. And I was sitting on the back ton and he said, let your experience come home to your heart. And I just started to cry. Mm -hmm. It's just what you needed to hear at that time. It's just what I needed to hear because I was not wanting to get into my heart because there was a lot to to get down there. So I started to sit at home after that experience. And basically what I would do is I would get my daughter to bed every night and I would sit bow to my cushions and I would sit down on my cushions and I would cry for 40 minutes. Did you have any Zazen instruction or did you just kind of Oh, I did. I went to I went to one of the Sunday uh, Zazen instructions. So you asked me about the first teacher I saw. So the first teacher I saw there was Ed, uh, yeah. and the second teacher I saw was Fu Schrader, who is currently the uh, abbess, the abiding abbess at uh, Green Gulch, and she had just been Shuso, and she was giving a class uh, on the life of the Buddha, which is typically the first class that one teaches after. Um, being Shuso, and she invited me to tea. Mm -hmm. And one of the things she said during tea, I had told her that I was basically kind of afraid all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and she said, but you have everything you need. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I don't believe that, mm -hmm. but I would really like to believe that. Mm -hmm. Maybe at some deep intuitive level that resonated. It did. Yeah, it did. So uh, then I went to my, my first, uh, I spent two weeks at Tassajara that summer. I took my vacation, my two weeks of vacation that I had from Apple and I went to Tassajara mm -hmm. and basically fell in love with it and have never fallen out of love uh, with Tassajara. Mm -hmm. I've now done infinite summers and four practice periods there and I still love it. Uh, and I re what I remember about those first couple summers at Tassajara was how much, how I fought to stay one more night, one more night, give me one more, one more hour in this paradise. Mm -hmm. And then the third summer I was there, I was like, wait, I could work on arranging my life out there mm -hmm. so that there isn't this huge difference between what I feel like when I'm at Tassajara and what I feel like for the other 50 weeks yeah. out of the year. And mm -hmm. so I made a vow. 
driving out the road. I was on the stage and uh, driving out the room. And I said, I vow to make my life no different between Tassajara and um, out here. Mm -hmm. And it took 10 years. But the last time that I went to Tassajara as a guest, mm -hmm. I, which was the summer of 2002, mm -hmm. I felt, I realized when I got there that my life outside of Tassajara now was no different. And this is before, life. is this before I live, living at Green Gulch? This was before I moved in. This was, this was like, you know, the summer. So I moved in um, in February of 2003, and this was the summer before that. Um, so I did, I worked at it. And of course, one of the things on working on making my life not different than a monastery was that I discovered that my actual work life out here in my high tech job was not sustainable and it wasn't me. So I, I checked my corporate career um, and moved into a monastery. Could you elaborate a little bit on what you felt about the corporate job was not simpatico with your um, your Zen practice? I was having to be two people and I couldn't sustain that. So uh, there was the person that I was when I was in Zen practice, mm -hmm. and there was the person that I was, uh, you know, in my high tech job. And I don't think either one of those were bad. I, I liked being in human resources. I think I was good at it. I was told that I was good at it, mm -hmm. but it was too much of a, of a disconnect. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't feel that I, could, that I could be the monk I liked in my corporate job. And again, this is something I don't wanna to go too deeply into, but uh, the corporation that I was working for at the time, which I want to be really clear was not Apple, but I'm not going to name which one it was. Mm -hmm. I, I was the VP of North American Human Resources and the uh, executive staff asked me to do something that I considered to be illegal mm -hmm. from a labor law standpoint. And so it was very easy to quit. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't have to think about their request. I said, no, thank you. Here's my letter of resignation. Uh, and so I quit. Uh, and got my daughter off to college and moved into a monastery. Mm -hmm. And when I was ordained, uh, I took a vow to not work for a paycheck again uh, in this life. Uh, mm -hmm. I do accept Donna, but I don't work for a paycheck. So I have now been 20 years, mm -hmm. right? 2002, right, 20 mm -hmm. years. Uh, mm -hmm. without a paycheck. And what I have learned in that 20 years is that the universe provides if I just let it. Mm -hmm. If I just let it and just notice the offerings as they come. Mm -hmm. um, Do you know uh, Kokyo Hinko? Very well. He was the Eno when I moved into Green Gulch. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I've, I, I have to say I've always, uh, I mean, not always, I've only known him for a couple of years, but I, uh -huh. He's really also in that I'm not going to take a paycheck and I'm going to see what the universe can provide. Yes. And, I, and I really admire the courage that that takes because I because there was a junction in my life where I could have gone down that path and I didn't take it. You know, mm -hmm. I took more of a householder path. And you know, and 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 I love my kids and I've enjoyed my career and you know, I love my wife dearly. So I, so I have no regrets. Mm -hmm. But I have to be honest with myself. There is a lack of courage in just taking that plunge. And I, and I really admire people like you that have done it, you know. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, it actually, <laughs> the, the funny part about this, I suppose, is that, that when I actually had the high tech job and I was making lots of money, I would worry all the time, you know. Mm -hmm. And now that I, you know, don't have a paycheck, I don't worry about I actually don't worry about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Support so, shows up. It, mm -hmm. it does. So had you set any sashin prior to moving in the Green Gulf? Did you have some experience with kind of more intensive practice? Uh, I did. I had not. Let's see. Is that true? I want to make sure here. I had not. I had not sat a sashin before mm -hmm. I moved into Green Gulf. I had sat one day sittings. Mm -hmm. And all I knew from that was I wanted more. Was, was the physical or emotional difficulty of ramping up the intensity of practice an issue for you? The like, physical was, um, the, the emotional was like, this is home. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. So, so that wasn't hard. The, uh, you know, you end up with very, very strong thighs, right? From 33 bows a day, right? So, so the physicality of sitting, uh, and I realized I did my last Hasahara practice period five years ago when I was when I turned 60 it was mm -hmm. the year I turned 60. So I did the winter, the the um, winter practice period. Those are always harder because it's mm -hmm. just freezing. Um, I did the winter 2017 practice period with uh, Rinso Ed Statizen. Mm -hmm. uh, at Tassahara. And when I got done with that and was and was on the stage driving out from that practice period, my body said to me, don't you ever do that to me again. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I mean, a lot of it is from really bad posture, but my knees are just shot. Right? Yeah. You know, especially when I was younger, you know, being a guy, I was like, uh -huh. macho, you know, I'm just go, you know, and, and really, I've, I've damaged my body. And yeah. Have you had any I have. I'm actually in physical therapy uh, and have been for a while. It's it's very helpful. It's actually preventing me from having to have knee and hip replacement, at least so far, which is great. For me, it wasn't my knees. It was my iliotibial band, the IT band uh, that runs down the side of the leg really got um, mangled. Um, and so I I am on physical therapy for an hour a day to deal with the IT band issues so that I don't have to have things replaced at least not yet do you think it's directly from extensive zazen oh yeah oh yeah in fact you know my physical therapist you know asked me for how i got into this position and i you know i explained to him you know the dozen years in a monastery and all the bowing and the sitting and he said yeah that'll do it <laughs> yeah um i'm curious what kind of posture do you do, you do now for zazen uh, i i mostly sit in a chair mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I had some, of course, as we do, it's like, is that real zazen? Does that really, <laughs> you know, we go through this, you know, we judge ourselves. And then I decided when I did this last Tassahara practice period that I would actually request a chair for the whole practice period. Mm -hmm. And it was fine, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. You, so you it was fine. Like you, Samadhi was the same. And... Samadhi was the same. In fact, in, in a way, it was, it was easier to drop into that because I wasn't, my body wasn't, in pain. So I did sit in half lotus on the ton for meals. They were able mm -hmm. to give me both a, a ton seat and a, and a chair seat right next to it. Uh, but the rest of the time I sat in a chair and it was actually uh, quite wonderful. Great. Yeah. Um, so when you, so you, um, when you moved to Gringles, had you committed to a teacher at that point? Yes, Ed. Yes, he, he had already been, I had already taken, let's see. So he was, he uh, officially started to be my teacher in uh, 94. Mm -hmm. And I took the precepts with him in 97 and then moved in uh, mm -hmm. in 2003 and was ordained by him there at, in 2005. So, um, so you would see it when he, cause he did at that point he was doing monthly retreats at Green. That's right. right? Mm -hmm. So he, you would see him when he would come in and do dokusan with him there. Yeah, and that? we would talk on the phone and email, you know, in the meantime. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did he have any sort of curriculum for you as far as like priestcraft or anything like that? Or is it more just what's going on with your life right now? Yeah, it's, I mean, this is, you know, this is Ed. So it's like, let your experience come home to your heart. You know, what's, yeah. what's up for you? Um, the, mm -hmm. the curriculum that I got was, you know, just, I just did the study curriculum at Green Gulch, whatever they were teaching, I took. So I took the class, took all the classes and, um, you know, took a vow, you know, to get through Shobogenzo and all the Nikayas and, you know, all of that. And it was just, all of it was just, you know, water, water to mm -hmm. the soil. Yeah. yeah, it was it was wonderful. Yeah, yeah. you um, more than a lot of priests I know, you're really into the sutras and copying sutras. And what do you think the source of that is from? Well, the it, it's true. I've been copying sutras um, for uh, you know a couple decades now. Mm -hmm. I had a wonderful teacher for that, Agent Linda Cutts, the former mm -hmm. abbess, now senior Dharma teacher uh, at uh, Green Gulch. She really inspired me in that. And it's uh, one of the, so other than meditation, I would say my two meditation activities are sutra copying and sewing Buddha's robe. Mm -hmm. And again, it's just that settled, quiet, uh, deep pool 
that I need to be able to then go out and teach in particular, uh, because as you might imagine, the last thing an introvert wants to do is talk to a room full of 150 people, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> Funny, I never would have struck you as an introvert. Thank you. Uh, I mean, not that we know uh, I, each other that well, but I've, you know, I've been to your Dharma talks and, uh, you know, we've chatted and I, I never, because I'm fairly much an internet or introvert, you know, uh -huh. I mean, not completely, you know, but, but, you know, but, more so on that side of the and I, I never would have guessed that of you, which is- Oh, well, thank you. I um, I think, uh, the, fortunately, I uh, got, I was, I received a lot of very helpful media training when I was in corporate life. Uh, so, you know, I've been on TV and, and stuff like that. So you're coached really well for that. And yeah. I think that that was really helpful. So I would, you know, I would give these talks and I would, you know, do these TV programs and then I would go sleep for three days, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And turn off all my devices and lock the door. So, yeah. Does does one-on-one, -on -one, um, like kind of intimate interaction, does that drain you too? Like Dokusan, is that does that drain you in the same sense? Oh, or? I could I could do Dokusan all day. Mm -hmm. I really could. That I do not find that draining because that's, you know, that's mm -hmm. that. You know, it's it's only a Buddha and a Buddha. It's mm -hmm. tell me about your life and I'll tell you about mine. You know, just like we're doing right now. This does, this is not draining. Um, yeah, for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so did you? Uh, so I know when you do practice periods, you're kind of. It, it, maybe I'm wrong, but my understanding is you're kind of encouraged to do dokusan with whoever is leading the practice period. That's right. right. Yeah. Yeah. And then, but your teacher was not living there at the center. Was that is that was that strange, or did it just flow well? I actually, it was it was kind of wonderful um, because since I didn't have a res resident teacher, mm -hmm. they let me do dokusan with everybody. Okay. <laughs> Which was great because you get different perspectives. Um, and after I had lived there for a while, I, I learned who was best to go to for whatever was up, mm -hmm. you know, for me. Uh, and so, but it was, in a way, it was great because since my teacher wasn't resident, I kind of had carte blanche to go see everybody. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about maybe name a couple of names who, who you would go and see and what you thought they were good at? If you don't mind going into those details. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, Linda Cutts, uh, Agent Roshi, um, I did seven practice periods with her, including my Shuso practice mm -hmm. period. She was the leader of the practice period where I was Shuso. And um, so I'll just give you one example because it kind of encapsulates the whole thing. So I did the winter 2006 practice period at Tassahara. That was right after my mother died. And I needed to get away from the craziness uh, out here of people saying, oh, she's in a better place. Oh, she's out of pain. And I'm like, my mother died. Come on, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. stop, with, stop it with the platitudes. Mm -hmm. So I went to Tassahara um, right after my mom died, did that, that practice period, which um, Agent Roshi was leading. And I remember I went to the first Dokusan with her. And of course I had something I wanted to bring up and I sat down, I bowed to her and I sat down in front of her and I just lost it. I just started to sob and I couldn't sit upright. And so, you know, she was, she was here and I was over here and I just folded over and just laid my head, you know, on her cushion and cried. And she took the edge of her okesa and she just covered me with with her robe mm -hmm. and it was, it, was that, a refuge. it was a refuge and she uh, was a refuge uh, for me mm -hmm. um, so for would me. you say that's part of her strength is that she has a real heart connection yeah mm -hmm. yeah and she you know she she just listens mm -hmm. and that's and that's uh, wonderful. Um, the other person uh, that sticks in my mind that I remember was uh, Rick Sloan, uh, who doesn't live there anymore, uh -huh. but the last he was the Tenzo was his last job, I think, um, there. And I, I loved going to him because I would bring up an issue and he would bring up a totally different perspective on it, you know, and it was great because it cracks you open when somebody 
does that, uh, broadens perspective. And I, I would love that. And, and I couldn't wait, you know, to go see what's he going to say about this that that is just, and it wasn't off the wall and weird. It was just a genuinely different perspective that, that he would bring. And I, I love that. Uh, was there any teacher you were kind of impressed with or kind of like Prajna depth or anything like that? You know, where you're like, wow, this person, like he or she is, this person knows their stuff, you know? Yeah, so so this is, uh, is an interesting story. And, and I have to preface this by saying, I'm not saying anything that I haven't said to him directly to his face. So I'm not telling okay. stories, but, but, you know, Reb Anderson has this, this deep understanding uh, of the Dharma that, that is brilliant uh, and extremely knowledgeable and it doesn't speak to me. It doesn't. And I deeply appreciate and acknowledge that it does speak to many to many people. Um, I learned things. Is it too in cerebral? All, I'm say, it's that? cerebral, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, and I would say that um, I learned something in every th single one of his Dharma talks, something very deep mm -hmm. uh, intellectually, and it didn't touch my heart. And mm -hmm. I have told him this, so I'm, I'm not saying it, but I, I greatly appreciate both his scholarship and his teaching. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not a criticism of him that it doesn't touch me. It's not a criticism of me. It's just, you know, um, yeah. we we find we find the teacher that we need, mm -hmm. um, and the teacher that speaks to us. Uh, and I appreciate Reb's teaching very, mm -hmm. very much. Mm -hmm. I do. How about priestcraft? You know, like being you know being. Um, uh, uh, can above the, you know, the head of the Tonto, right. Yeah, Tonto. Yeah. You know, was there anyone and like, is there anyone that kind of was a mentor to you as, as far as like the forms of being a priest? Yeah. So Kokio Hankel. Yeah. Oh, okay, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. yeah. So he, you know, he was the Eno when I got there and he was the Tonto mm -hmm. later and he just has such a gentle inviting way um, mm -hmm. with the forms and the forms can feel pretty samurai and pretty rigid and you know mm -hmm. oh my goodness if I misstep here but he wasn't like that it was like you can mm -hmm. do this this was the message that I got from him and from most of the Enos actually and so when I was Eno I tried mm -hmm. it, what I tried to do was to be encouraging the encouraging Eno not the punitive mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know. yeah, um, what did you think of when you first got into Zen? What did you think of the, the forms like the bowing, the chanting and so forth? Yeah, so yeah. I really needed that. Um, the schedule, which is a form, I, I needed the bowing and the chanting and the schedule because what I really needed to do was fall apart. And mm -hmm. so the forms held me mm -hmm. while I while I went to that place, you know, I uh, feel what you're feeling and I didn't want to. Well, eventually we need to. Right eventually it's going to come up anyway and mm -hmm. so the forms for me were a refuge uh, mm -hmm. and still are mm -hmm. yeah um so uh did you were you at um were you at residential practice all the way up to your dharma transmission or was there yes. a break mm -hmm. yeah. no i was in residential practice the whole time so at, so when you got when you were ordained and you were living as a priest, did you have aspirations to be a teacher or is it more just, I wanna wake up or was it some combination or? Uh, it was, um, let's just live today. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't have, uh, I did wanna be a priest because I wanted to take the practice as far as I could. Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't, I didn't but, but after that, I didn't have a goal of Dharma transmission. Mm -hmm. um, it was actually my teacher who suggested it uh, in a in a dokasan. This was mm -hmm. before I was shuso. So he said, you know, you need to be shuso first. Um, mm -hmm. But I was actually sewing for I was sewing for dharma transmission when I was shuso. Mm -hmm. So what um, was that intimidating to you? That transition? Uh, it was intimidating afterward. I didn't know what I was getting myself into, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, in a way. Uh, when you have a brown robe on, and 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 also when you have a black robe on, but mm -hmm. slightly, but somewhat less so, you have a big target 
painted on you. Um, and I want to be really clear here. I, because of, of recent events, I'm not talking about a physically violent target, but you are all of a sudden a projection for everybody's, you mm. know, experiences, good or bad, with religion, priests, women, what, whatever you are presenting uh, as, uh, and you have a brown robe on, it invites everybody's mm -hmm. imaginings. Yeah. You know, really in a lot does. of ways, this might be pop psychology, but I really feel like kind of the human race kind of needs different archetypes to yeah. function. Yeah. Like my brother, he's pretty, even though he's like never been in the war, in the military or anything, but he's kind of the warrior archetype. You mm -hmm. know, just, just mm -hmm. everything in his life has just always been that, mm -hmm. you know, and you know, and then there's, there's maybe like the engineering planning archetype and that's probably me, you know, mm -hmm. and then there's the charismatic leader. And, and and I definitely think one of those archetypes is priest, you know, cleric. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, I think, um, you know, and I, and I think people respond at a kind of like a, almost like a DNA yeah. level to just the archetype of priest. I think that's like, you know, and, and I wonder if that, is a little bit of what you experienced there, you know? Yeah, I think it is. And the other thing to say is that, um, you know, we can go into, this is a bit of a left turn, you know, to go in there or not, but this is what I came to this life to be. And so being that archetype and being that target, mm -hmm. I, it's okay, because that's what I came here for. So, you know, so, so it's all right. And, uh, you know, it, it can get a little scary sometimes uh the the vehemence with which it, I'll, I'll kind of say this generally but i have had um some situations where i uh, people take what they see of me as an invitation to explore inwardly themselves mm -hmm. and then when they look inwardly they don't like what they find there and then they blame me for making them look, for quote unquote, making them um, mm -hmm. look there. And I've had people get verbally abusive um, with me, uh, threatening. Uh, fortunately, none of that has really come to fruition, but I have had to exit some people out of my life. And this, is this established students that you were working with? I, uh, yes, wow. yes it was. Um, I was trying to think through through the and this isn't a lot of people we're talking like three three or four okay people yeah. um but they were all established students and uh they were not gonna look there and they were gonna bat away the person who they thought was making them look there yeah i, get it. I, I think i think that everyone i mean I'm not a big fan of like template spiritual paths, you know, mm -hmm. like not everyone goes through the bull, you know, the 10 ox welding preacher right. uh -huh. you know, sequence, yeah. you know, I mean, like uh -huh. I, I think it's like relationships. There's no script, you know, it's different for right. everyone. Mm -hmm. That said, I think there's, I think for every serious practitioner, there gets to the point where Zen needs to stop being for comfort. Right. And, for peace. and I think a lot yeah. of people, and I barely made that turn. You know, maybe and maybe I have it and I'm fooling myself. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But mm -hmm. but you know, yeah. Like I, I don't think a lot of people are able to make that turn. You know? Yeah, it's yeah, and, and so you know, my thought is my my belief for that is, you know, I wish them well on their journey mm -hmm. and that maybe later in this lifetime or six lifetimes from now, because uh you know, because in a sense I took I took it, but I also bowed out and and mm -hmm. backed away, they will eventually develop the courage to look there. But I, mm -hmm. but I think you're right. And I think that that was my own experience when I said that I, I liked the forms and the bowing and the chanting and, you know, mm -hmm. the clothing and all of that, because it held, it held me up while I fell apart. Mm -hmm. um, there, is, there is a time in our life where we realize that we really need to cry. Mm -hmm. And we fight that because we have this deep sense that once we start crying, it's not going to stop. Mm -hmm. And that's that expression of what needs to come forth there. What I would say to anybody, to you and anybody, you know, who's 
who's going to see this podcast is uh, it will stop eventually. Mm -hmm. Mine took four years. Uh, it will, the crying will stop. And mm -hmm. what you will realize at some point is that it is not a cry of sadness. It is a cry of relief and release of this thing down there that is saying, finally, finally, they're willing to look. You finally, a little bit. thank you. That's yeah. powerful. Yeah. Finally, they're willing to give me some attention. Finally, they're willing to hear me. You know, I, um, when you're talking about the, um, you know, people being intense. So, you know, it's part of my training. I'm supposed to kind of do these Dharma service projects. And, you know, and this podcast is one of them. Thank you. One of them, one of them was, um, you know, kind of exploring zazen and stuff from a kind of a neurobiological perspective mm -hmm. and part of that i'm like you know when people sign up you know like oh you know you can we can chat about it you know or um and and some and this one person like you know they're just they latched on to me and you know and they were like you know i'm suicidal and i need your help and like i was like mm -hmm. i i don't know yeah, how right. to deal with it. you know like this is way above my pay grade you know and, mm -hmm. I, and, I, and I then i was afraid like if i if i like what if I say, no, I'm not going to help you with that. You know, are they going to kill themselves? You know, I mean, like it was freaked me out in a serious way, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. I, and, and, you know, I just like, <laughs> maybe there was no winning in that situation. Well, yeah. I've, I've actually had that happen. I've had two people make a, what's called a credible threat of suicide, meaning a specific time, place and method. Mm -hmm. uh, and fortunately we live in a, a clergy mandatory reporting state. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we are required when somebody does that to get them some help. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, in, fortunately, you know, all of us priests and teachers out there, we all have our list of all of our social support agencies uh, and people uh, out there. And I have that too. So when somebody, you know, uh, we, we need to realize that we are, we are in front of that person for a dharmic purpose, not for a psychotherapeutic purpose and and we need to excuse me for using this this metaphor but we do need to stay in our lane on that mm -hmm. and even though i have a master's in counseling i don't use that in when i'm i'm in dokusan or other ways with people because that's not what i'm here for i'm here for this i'm not mm -hmm. a psychotherapist and i have a list of people who are many of whom have a practice and i call them Mm -hmm. so yeah. i'm sorry that that you ended up in that situation it is very scary uh mm -hmm. when somebody tells you that they're going to go to the bridge wednesday night and jump off yeah. it's yeah, hard I mean, to be, yeah to be clear he never he never said i'm going to commit suicide he okay. just said i have those urges sometimes yeah sometimes he, okay you know yeah. and, 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 and he maybe even put it in a, a past tense even but uh -huh. like or i'm trying to remember exactly how i went i mean but you know it needs drug abuse and I think it was, and okay. in, in what was also weird was he was in England, you know, oh, he, was, uh -huh. he emailed me from England. So like, yeah, I don't know, it was a weird situation. It, 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 it was very disconcerting. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, and I'm curious, Sorry. what did, oh, that's okay. I mean, you know, I, I mean, hopefully, um, you know, I, I, I think I just said, you know, I'm always here for you, but you know, I definitely recommend psychological therapy that's that's where i would start you know right I I something like that's that. very good that, yeah, that's like, the so answer. i didn't turn him down i just said i'm here for you if you need to talk you know yeah yeah that's but, right um um oh you know i think i'm so i think i think that guy was actually someone i met on, anyway it doesn't it doesn't matter but um I, i'm curious what do you see as the difference between spiritual awakening and psychological maturity do you think they overlap do you think they are completely different lanes do you think one influences the other do you think you can be one without the other could you talk on that a little bit I, is that a false dichotomy as as dogen says and is it either the genjo koan or the fukan um you know intelligence or lack of it doesn't matter <laughs> right so so i i think that there is some intelligence about our own psychological workings uh, that can be helpful. Mm -hmm. And 
what are those bumper stick phrases, right? Bumper sticker phrases, um, don't believe everything you think. Um, you are not your mind, you know, pick your, <laughs> you know, pick your phrase there. So I think, uh, I think it's helpful. And what's coming up for me right now, Barry, is, um, for example, Daniel Goleman's um, uh, both emotional intelligence and destructive emotions, mm -hmm. the conversations that he and some scientists had with the Dalai Lama about mm -hmm. this, this very topic. And what's so interesting is the Dalai Lama's response to that is, is he gets all enthusiastic about the science and then basically he comes in in the last chapter and says yeah but that's not quite it <laughs> right yeah. Yeah. it's not quite that's not quite that's not quite it there is a you know there is a side here in a sense on the way to big mind if you will that involves things like intuition mm -hmm. And things that our senses, including our mind, uh, are kind of not helpful. In fact, they can be the distractions. Um, so I think part of practice is trusting that beyond beyond local mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, when when you hear when you hear this phrase, you know we are all one. Do you see that as more how we are perceiving reality? Or do you think that's a like an ontological description of the universe? Oh, I think it's absolutely an ontological description uh, of the universe. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we we've got way too many examples that we think are just outliers and, and chance uh, mm -hmm. that um, that we are all connected. And mm -hmm. that uh, our our actions, you know, do influence the Andromeda galaxy um, mm -hmm. to sort of draw the, you know, crazy conclusion. But, mm -hmm. but I do uh, believe that. Mm -hmm. And so it would behoove us if we're going to put stuff out to put out stuff that is, that errs on the side of suffering reduction. Mm -hmm because we don't know how far it extends. Right. But it does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so you you were still a resident when you got Dharma transmission. Um, this, did you leave residency soon afterwards? I did. I did. Uh, so I got Dharma transmission on Christmas Eve. This is the last day was Christmas really? Eve of 2013. Yeah. Uh, and then I immediately uh, went to the January intensive at Green Gulch. Mm -hmm. uh, my teacher has a belief that as soon as you're ordained, the next thing you need to do is a practice period. And I agree with that because then you kind of inhabit uh, mm -hmm. whatever robe you've just gotten yourself into. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was very helpful. So I went to the Green Gulch uh, January intensive. And then you said I, after ordination, did you mean uh, Dharma transmission? I, well, I was talking about both of them, both oh, okay. priest ordination and okay and Dharma transmission that you do, you, you get ordained either one of those, and then you do a practice period right after that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, uh, so I left the January intensive and I went immediately into a branching streams. Um, I was at Steve Weintraub um, had put out an invitation uh, for someone to go help uh, a sangha on the east coast whose guiding teacher was dying and i thought oh this is a good thing for a brown brand new brown robe person to do so i did that and uh, left green gulch and residency at that same time and went uh, twice that year uh, mm -hmm. for uh, two months at a time to mm -hmm. uh, help this uh, sangha that had just uh, lost their guiding teacher had you already planned to leave San Francisco Zen Center kind of machine at that point? Well, I had because uh, the idea is that once you have Dharma transmission, uh, as they used to say in was it Girl Scouts or Campfire Girls, you know, you've now flown up, right? <laughs> so it's time to <laughs> time to fly away mm -hmm. uh, and be a teacher uh, out there. So that was kind of the idea. So mm -hmm. and then uh, this opportunity showed up. Mm -hmm. to serve the Sangha on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. Some people stick around, and I've always been curious from a sociological perspective, 
you know, because some people, you know, like um, um, the tall Irish, um, Irish priest at City Center, Paul Holler. Paul oh, Holler. Yes. Uh-huh. Like he seems, I mean, he was there at my first session in 1992, I guess it was. Mm-hmm. And he's been there, it seems like he's been there the whole time. And of course, Reb Anderson and Linda Cutts, like some of them are all, have, have been there mm-hmm. my entire Zen career, you know, mm-hmm. almost 30 years now. They've been priests at one of the places mm-hmm. where some people leave. I mean, is it just random or is there? Yeah, you know, here's how that lines up. You know? I, I I don't want to speak for anybody else. I can just say that in speaking for myself, I I I felt I felt called to uh, to be the monastery out here is uh-huh. probably the best way um, mm-hmm. to say it. I could have stayed. You know, I could have stayed there and it, and it would have been fine, but but I think there would have been a little bit of a psychic disconnect that mm-hmm. I feel that, um, you know, my my heart uh, is is not in being a priest in the world. I want to be really clear about that, but because mm-hmm. I don't feel like I'm a priest in the world. I feel mm-hmm. like I am uh, embodying uh, a an alternative. Mm-hmm. to the craziness out here and the best way for me to do that is to be out here mm-hmm. and to be and to show up as the monastery out here so i know one of your students working towards ordination you know we were in a sewing group together and stuff yes. like that uh-huh. do you um are, are most of your students people kind of in a clerical context like that or are you working mostly with lay people or a mix or uh, let's see. So I have two priest candidates right now, two lay entrustment candidates, and, and everybody has a robe, uh, either from me or from a, a prior teacher. Mm-hmm. Uh, so and and we did a Sangha week at Tassahara in 2018. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're they've all done practice periods or you know longer stays. Um, I think a couple of them would probably move in if they could. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so uh, I would say that they're they're committed to bringing practice to mm-hmm. wherever they find themselves uh, out uh, in the world. But they're you know if there's the the false dichotomy here, right, of the the lay the lay practitioner and the the sort of monastic, I think that they're. I, th- I would say that most of them are a little slightly mm-hmm. past halfway toward mm-hmm. the monastic yeah. <laughs> side. Yeah. I, I've always seen the the dichotomy in whether you're a householder or whether you're a resident yeah. practitioner. That seems to be like mm-hmm. like where where there's actually a distinction with the difference, you know. Yeah. You know, wh- whether you, you have a career and a family and of course some people have careers and families within Zen Center, but mm-hmm. but you, you know what I mean? Like yeah. if, mm-hmm. you know, where where being a priest is not your job, where some That's people right. being, a, be, being a practitioner or a priest is your job, you know. Yeah. I think that might be a, a difference. I'm curious for um, a couple questions about lay entrustment, mm-hmm. since you have some candidates. Mm-hmm. Uh, for one, like, what are you looking for in a student that you would see as a candidate for entrustment? Like, what? So, uh, what one of my students, I did. Or? One of my students, I did lay entrust. So, um, she's. Uh, um, I, I'd like to protect their privacy, so I won't. That's fine. Yeah. But, but she has she had been the leader of the sangha there locally um, for you know ten years before we met. Uh, she had a very strong practice, and in a sense, for for her standing with that sangha, it really made sense to uh, do lay entrustment with her because she already was you know uh, in a sense she already was and my other student who is actually i have two students i have one who's already lay entrusted and two who are preparing for that it's clear to me that their hearts are with uh teaching um as as their expression of their path not that they have all the answers um mm-hmm. but it but they really have some enthusiasm for uh, taking the Dharma forward in the world. And mm-hmm. that's, you know, mm-hmm. lovely. Mm-hmm. And your entra- the lay entrustment ceremony, do you model it on Shiho or is it totally different? Is it private? Is it public? Is it uh, it's public. Um, it's, it's more like a, um, uh, uh, like an ordination 
like either mm -hmm. Jukai or, or priest ordination. So they get the Rakasu, the green Rakasu, uh, mm -hmm. with the difference that when you do lay entrustment, the last um, event in the, in the ordination ceremony is that they give their first Dharma talk as a teacher. So is it almost in a way like, um... Uh, like the Dharma combat ceremony in a weird sort of way where people it, yeah there's part of it part of it uh, is like that it's it's what's the name of that of, ceremony I'm spacing on the name the Japanese uh, name. Mondo oh yeah. I, I guess I didn't even know that so, uh -huh. yeah anyway. yeah so uh, it's it's a combination of a precepts taking ceremony a Mondo and a Dharma talk yeah and, and, and is that is that the basic template in Suzuki Roshi lineage like is there yeah. kind of a yeah and um and, and the next question I'm asking, so I'm, I'm kind of working on a project of just kind of exploring Dharma transmission in North America, or I guess in the West. Mm -hmm. and, and one question I, I, I like to ask people is, um, what do you see as, do you see as Dharma trans transmission, is that a lineage dead end? Would you be comfortable when you're Dharma transmitted, I'm sorry, lay entrusted students, in turn lay entrusting someone else? Or do you think that is purely the role of a priest? Well, I, I, I can sort of only speak for the parameters around me, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and that is that I, my understanding of San Francisco Zen Center's and Suzuki Roshi's lineage rules around this, which I'm fine to uphold, that's fine mm -hmm. with me, is that my lay and trusted, the people that I lay and trust can give the precepts if I'm in the room and I do all the inscribing, they cannot um, ordain priests, mm -hmm. they can't give Dharma transmission, and they can't lay and trust somebody else. Okay. And I um, I'm okay with those mm -hmm. with those rules. My my currently lay in, student who is already lay and trusted, we have done one Jukai together. Mm -hmm. Um, with her students, and we will do another one this November. When you say um, Suzuki Roshi, are these rules that were explicitly stated to you, yes. or is it or more? In, okay. Yeah. 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 It, 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 I guess this would be the elder council that comes up with these. Uh, these it, it could be. I the yeah. abbot's council, the you know the myriad councils, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so I don't know, but there is a, there is sort of a, a a written set of understandings of what. Mm what the various robe colors can do. Do you have um, any sort of, um, so you do branching streams, but do you do you have any kind of institutional contact with the mothership anymore? Or are you largely kind of off on your own? Uh, kind of off on my own, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I do have, I do also have, con, uh, you know, working with other non San Francisco Zen Center um, sanghas. Oh, you do? How did that yeah. come about? They call me up out of the blue. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Basically. Uh -huh. Can you give this talk? Yeah, sure. <laughs> and your um you, your uh, work with branching streams, um what does that entail? Are you kind of the teacher of some of those groups or are you advising the teachers? It, like, on a day-to-day -day basis, what what is your role? Oh, it's it's it basically it's whatever they want. Um so I have gone to branch to to various sanghas for I, uh, you know, two months at a time for uh, a day for a workshop for a sewing machine. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, it's kind of whatever they want. And sometimes it's, well, in the case of this one, I mentioned the guiding teacher was dying and they needed, mm -hmm. you know, some uh, a, a teacher present. Mm -hmm. uh, for that, um, sometimes when I go for long periods, it's because the guiding teacher wants to do a practice period themselves, for example, mm -hmm. uh, or something else for their own development. And so they want somebody there to sort of, you know, hold, keep the lights on, <laughs> you know, keep the incense lit. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's for shorter um, sewing, Dharma talks, workshops. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of what, you know, whatever they, whatever they want. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's a little bit of a segue to, to the last thing I wanted to ask you is how did you get involved as a sewing teacher? Is it just because they needed someone, you were good at it, or I mean, is there, uh, is there an actual lineage where you're like, okay, you're officially a sewing teacher now? Well, uh, there's, there is, uh, or there, yeah, I think that the, that it would be safe to say that there is sort of a lineage of sewing teachers that was from uh, Joshin San to Blanche Hartman. 
And then Blanche Hartman uh, taught a lot of us um, uh, how to be sewing teachers. And uh, I just, sewing my first rockasu, I just fell in love with it. And my sewing teachers for that rockasu were Galen Godwin, who is now the, uh, has for many years been the abbess of Houston. Zen Center and Maya Wender, uh, the tea teacher uh, at Green Gulch, they were both. And I, I just, um, I fell in love with the practice. And I remember saying to Blanche one time is, is there any way I could be, I could, you know, be a sewing teacher? And she said, come on down. <laughs> you know? So, and she and I, um, and Christina Lanehair, I think, co-led a, a sewing sashin at Green Gulch, the summer sewing sashin, which must have been the summer June of 94, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the, uh, I'm sorry, not, no, 2004, 2004. Mm -hmm. um, and at the end of that sewing sashin, Blanche said, okay, I'll put you on the list as a sewing teacher now. <laughs> Uh, no midnight bowing to each other. Yeah. Okay. Well, great. Uh, is there any before we kind of sign off here? Is there anything else you'd like to cover or talk about or any, any kind of idea? Anything you would like to share? Um, Dogen said in one of his writings uh, that the greatest challenge to our practice is when it gets dark and we don't think it's going to get light again. And I think we're in that. I think we're in, I think we're in the dark right at the moment. And the most important thing for us to remember is, is we're the light. And it might be pretty dim and our batteries might be running low, but whatever we can do, whatever we can do. And I'm not even at this point thinking whatever we can do to make it better that might even be too tall in order, mm -hmm. but let's, let's concentrate on not making it worse. And I guess there's always the idea of bearing witness too. Bearing witness, right? Yeah, yeah, bearing witness, not making it worse. If we don't think we can make it better, let's just listen and bear witness and vow that we will do our best to not make it worse. Okay, well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Barry, this. this was delightful. Thank you so okay. much. Okay, thank right. you. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.